I would like to call this regular meeting of the OPC to order at uh, for September 14th, and we're just a little after 9, 9.05. Um, first item is um, approval of prior meeting minutes. May I have a motion to table that agenda item until a future meeting, as we have a couple of people who um, are not here and are being filled in with people that may not have had the chance or the opportunity to read the minutes. Jill moves. Steve seconds. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'll give a brief report um, from the first selectman. So on COVID, we are now going back to cases, and uh, we will be reporting cases on our website going forward. Um, between August 30th and the 15th, or the 5th of September, there were 17 cases re uh, reported for COVID. Flu shots will again be offered this year. They'll start on October 13th is the first opportunity. Um, you can look on our website for the full schedule. You can't actually make an appointment at this time, but um, that will be up and running soon for appointments. Right, Linda? Yes. Do we have an idea? It says soon on the website. On soon, okay. Um, over the past few months, uh, town officials, staff, and consultants have continued to be hard at work completing due diligence on Great Island. Um, we've uncovered some important issues that must be adequately addressed before the town can take ownership. The town remains excited about the purchase, and I'm confident in our ability to ups, um, address these and resolve these issues. Last Thursday, I attended a public hearing uh, in Westport regarding an aquarium rate increase. Mm -hmm. This is um, right now looking like a significant number that will impact our residents and there will be other public hearings um, that are you, that people can attend, and you can also send in write, written testimony. It, um, as long as written testimony is in before October 25th, it will be part of the um, record for Pura uh, when they're taking into. Um, they'll take that into consideration. There'll be an opportunity afterwards, but I would suggest if you're interested in this, I will be following this and, and reporting on it. As time goes on, and you can also go to the Aquarian website and for more information. <clears throat> Ox Ridge, I'm sure Jill will go over it. Um, I just want to thank the building committee again for all of their work on this first phase, and also the HHR building committee that's been meeting very regularly. These volunteers that step forward in our town are really, really appreciated. Uh, we are still in a drought too, um, for. Um, on weather, so I know people like to fire up those outdoor fire pits, just asking everybody to be be super careful. Mm -hmm. um, on volunteers, I want to thank everyone that did sign up to be on the RTM. You needed paperwork to be officially on the ballot. You needed that included um, or, or to our office, town clerk's office by yesterday, but there still is an opportunity to be a write-in candidate, and I don't know if Lois is going to go over that or not. The, no, okay. So if you do want to be a writing candidate, you um, can contact our town clerk and she will um, steer you to how to do that. The Board of Selectmen will be having a, on our October 3rd regular meeting, we will be having a information session dedicated to water management. And this will be an important meeting for members of our community. We will be looking at what we have done in the past and what, um, what we recommend going forward for both um, individuals and for our, on our town side. And I want to mention there is a road race this coming up this weekend, um, and I, I, I will be there at the start, but I actually won't be running. But there will be 500 people, um, approximately 500 people running in this, so the police have a traffic advisory out. There are many roads over there by Long Neck, Good Wives, Sunswick, Delfield Island in that area that will be closed off and the um, beach launch actually boat launches I'm sorry from Pear Tree will be suspended on Sunday from 8 to 10 8 to 11 the race is organized by the community fund for the benefit of the youth and family social services programs in Darien Norwalk and Stanford and I wish great luck to all the runners I have one last one last thing we, I'm going to read this because it's pretty specific. We're looking for people to populate the Building Board of Appeals. The board must consist of at least one plumber and one electrician. Um, the remaining three members can be an engineer, an architect, or a builder. 
Um, these are pretty specific recommendations for this for this um, for this board. So I would ask you to take a look at the website, and they they don't hold regular meetings. I think the last meeting was uh, ten years ago. So this isn't a um, <laughs> um, so this isn't a, a, a really active committee. Um, but it is an important committee, and we're, we're looking for people to get applications in by September 19th. Okay, so that's all I have. Um, we'll just go around the room. Uh, Jill McCannon is filling in for Duke Deneen. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, the Board of Ed, as always, is pretty busy. Um, we are, our first priority this year is mental health. And so one of the things that we're looking at is the um, formation and hiring of a director of mental health. We've had two meetings on, the, on this topic and we'll um, have a third and a vote uh, in, in two weeks time. Um, we are, you know, of course still in the, as, as a town still in the postvention period, but that's typically four to six months. So we're near the end of that and we're looking at how to build infrastructure for our schools um, in all the ways possible. Um, but this, this position will look at some curriculum drivers and what we call SRBI, which is um, uh, student-based research interventions. Scientifically-based <laughs> research interventions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, together we can do it. Thank you, Terry. Um, which is your first tier when you have a student who's struggling. So we're looking at social-emotional learning. The idea being that someone who is um, putting together and moving forward with some of these initiatives, all of our staff are important in the life of one student or another. Some of our students go to coaches, some go to counselors, some go to teachers, some go to the art room. So we're trying to make sure that we've got a, a really broad base across our staff. And that's one of the things that this uh, position would take on. There are also several initiatives coming from the state that, that need a home. Uh, one is you need a, a family coordinator and in that capacity this role would work care a lot with town uh, because that family coordinator role needs to understand what's available. This person would also work with town quite heavily on post pension. Um, and then there's also for example um, we're about a year ahead of someone to actually specifically put uh, mental health support into our athletics programs. The state is requiring it. So, you know, given what we've seen happening, it seems to make sense, and we're happy to be ahead of the game on that. When's the next the vote on that? The vote will be at our next meeting, okay. uh, which is like the 26th or whatever that Tuesday is. Did you, get good response? Um, did you get good response to request to fill that position? We it's sorry. We are still uh, in the process of debating the position for oh, creation. I see. I see. Um, okay, thank good you. question. So I think you know once once we once we form it, we'll find out. But I certainly hope we do. <laughs> um, uh, secondly, another big priority for this year is negotiations. So those have kicked off. We've got another meeting on the twenty second. Uh, we, we have four members of the board. It's chaired by Duke, but four members of the board sit there, and we're supported by uh, the board of finance. In this case, it's it's Jim Palin. Um, and that's ongoing. Uh, we are paying close attention to the communities around us because we are, we are near the beginning of the cycle for the year, but we're not the first or second. So we're trying to see what's happening around us. Um, but of course, there's a lot of discussion about inflation and you know coming off of COVID. So you know we're expecting these to be interesting discussions, mm -hmm. and they have been already. Is there an right. outside law firm that works with you on that? Shipman and Goodwin supports us on that. Mm -hmm. Um, moving to facilities, our other big initiatives, Monica mentioned the um, Ox Ridge, and thank you for being there at the soft opening. Monica, I appreciate it, and thank you, Terry. Uh, Seth was there, thank you. Um, it, it's really exciting. Our academic week, wing opened to students and staff this, this um, well, last month, I guess, technically. Um, it's a beautiful building. If you haven't had a chance to see it, um, please go take a look. Um, we're just thrilled. We do st are still doing construction, of course, so we've got some temporary functions housed in our uh, former uh, ELP wing. That includes things like the library, so you know that we still have another year of construction, but there's a lot to celebrate right now with our, our students in the academic wing, so we're just thrilled. Um, the other piece is HHR. Um, I'm the vice chair on that, so I'll just go ahead and give you a little bit of an update. October is going to be a big month for us. We've finished our preliminary schematic design and we've sent those out to cost estimators, two different cost estimators, 
we're expecting to get those costs back and then to see if what we've designed uh, is, is feasible financially. Um, once we get all of those numbers back, the HHRBC will, will arrive at a final schematic design and that will go out to planning and zoning, to the architectural review board, to uh, the Board of Ed needs to vote on it. That will all happen in October. So, uh, Steve, you may have heard from us already. Um, Jeremy Ginsburg did sit with us and, and walk through, you know, helping us set up the, the whole process of who to go to for sign off and in what order and gave us some preliminary tips. So thank you to him for, for that support. Um, so uh, we will be at the RTM on Monday. Just for a very quick high, uh, quick update, we'll go and walk through Oxridge, and give you know, some pictures, and then we'll just give a quick update on specific milestones for um, HHRBC, because there isn't really much to, to show and tell at this point. Um, our last piece from a facilities perspective is uh, our lights are sitting at planning and zoning, and we look forward to hearing uh, how that goes. So we're following so that with interest. Light, <laughs> lights for the high school. Lights for the high school. For extended we did hours. Extended hours. Yes, okay. we did. We had a uh, we had a set of an agreement in place, and we looked. We would change. We changed the structure of it, and then also the timing of it. And so yeah, right now it's, that's it's not. It's they're adding one day, which is Saturday, and an hour and a half. Instead, it's shutting off at 7:30. It shuts off at 9 o'clock. It's not. It's nothing drastic by any stretch of imagination. Yeah. I wouldn't think so. No. 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 Yeah. We're just really looking at it, particularly from a safety perspective. We want people to get on and off the field uh, still lit up. Right, right now, we have, we're in a position where we have people exiting the field, you know, between 7 and 8. And the lights are going off right at 730, yeah. so practice is running right up to 730, and you've got a mass exodus of children in the dark. Yeah, I mean, so. you, and by, by level law, you're not even supposed to have um, the lights on for Fourth of July fireworks. If it's on a Saturday or Sunday. Say that again. If you had the Fourth of July fireworks was on a Saturday, you're not supposed to have the lights on. Why? That was in the resolution. Okay. You know, so stuff like that is going to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Steve, in that, while we're on that, is mm -hmm. there any noise component added to that? Yeah. There is. Yeah. Okay. It's it's really not. It's it's you follow the state code. Um, there was a, a topic of discussion in our debate. Um, like there's a state code that exempts sporting events for it. So for argument's sake, um, you know, somebody scores a touchdown, or if someone scores a goal in the cross or a goal in soccer at the end and the, the crowd roars, you know, that's exempt. The other item that comes up, and, and we talked about it, was um, at graduation when Kelsey Ovani is named, because she's graduating, she's plus 53, the fire truck guy blows his horn, you know, that's technically may not be allowed. They've never had a complaint in every single year they've done it. Um, you know, even when they score a touchdown in a football game, the fire truck blows up. So relative to that noise component, it's, you know, it's really a non-issue. Because we only really, the, the lights, the noise component for the, the lights only really affects when the lights are on. Right. I'm thinking more like during practices. I've heard this that, um, you know, there's music being played during practice to maybe. I hundred percent agree, but that's outside of the lights component. It is okay. I mean, that's not really part of the application. It's not. If you have a practice at three thirty on May seventeenth, the lights are not. Right. You okay. Know, it's not even light season. Right. We're not. That's not part of this application at all. Okay. So internally for us, um, none of our youth sports have access to the PA system. So if, it, if it's practice, it's only the high school, and that is regulated by the coaches and the high school staff. So um, there's a process for signing off on music and timing, and so okay. um, we are not expecting that, you know, again, to your point, this is outside, but still I think it's important for people to understand that the use of music at all times it's not allowed under the regulations, and we did put that regulation in place. It's not allowed by third parties. The, by third the, parties. The, the high school teams can do it. Correct, but the music has to be, exactly, but the music has to be signed off. Um, so yeah, that, that part we don't. By the administration. I mean, we, yeah, we don't get that deep into the weeds. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the, the, the way it's, it's set up, and it's been set up like this for years, the process, if somebody, in, in the real world, the process, the way the complaint's supposed to go, or should go, is somebody complains, 
they complain to the principal. Then, then the principal goes to the administration, then the administration goes to the Board of Ed, then the Board of Ed goes to, um, may, maybe goes to the Planning Zoning Director, and the Planning Zoning Director plan zone goes to the, board of the Planning Zoning Commission. I'm sure the first selectman's office gets involved at some point in time. That's never happened. You know, there, there's a very strict policy at the, at yes. the school level yes. where it doesn't, it doesn't get that far. And we don't need to get involved, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Sounds good. That's all of my report. Okay. Thanks, so, Jill. Over to you. So, go ahead, uh, Monica. Okay. Sorry. So, we'll go Lois. Schneider is filling in for Seth. Thank you for having me. Um, the next RTM meeting is Monday. And um, as Jill mentioned, there'll be uh, the school's briefing, which is really looked forward to. Good. Yeah, no, it's clear space, so it's perfect right. for Good. focus and, um, and, and understanding. Good. I'm, I'm, we're very excited about that. Um, the only voting issue on our, our meeting is for the special appropriation for 563000 to replenish the parks and rec expense account. So it's a very simple, straightforward meeting, so your contributions are much appreciated. Um, at the last rules meeting, we assigned planning, zoning, and housing to cover the issue of local control over accessory apartments as a prep for the upcoming discussions, potentially at the October meeting. I'm sure you will have more comments about that. Mm -hmm. So um, two items are being addressed to update RTM operations. Um, one is there's an issue of, um, there's a hope to create a way for people to understand the basics of Robert Ru Robert's Rules of Orders. <laughs> Uh, because <laughs> not only is it current, you know, new people don't understand it, but there are a lot of members of the RTM that have turned over over multiple years. And so we are trying to um, address that. Um, Seth has taken on that task and he's re um, researching existing videos and other kinds of information. If anybody knows of anything, would be appreciated. The idea is to do it um, either just send out and say, people, you can watch this, or maybe run something 15 minutes before an RTM meeting. It's not to directly address it, but that's possible, of um, addressing it in the meeting. And there are people, um, there's been some discussion about somebody from FOIA coming and talk to us and stuff like that. But we're watching that in timing in relationship to what the agendas are so that we keep people straight. And obviously, we don't want to do this until we start our next session. But that's one. Um, the other thing we're working on is, um, we're updating the, the um, Appendix B of the town code has a description of all the RTM committees, and it hasn't been updated in forever. Um, so um, we're, um, there's a draft of that out that um, multiple people are involved. Um, and the other part of it that um, is a thorough list of town boards, departments, committees, commissions, etc. Um, and they've come up with 120 different entities, um, and to assign them to make sure that they're incorporated into some responsible uh, coordination with some RTM committee. So we're clear on what we're doing in each of our committees, as well as um, you know if anything comes up. Um, this work is being led by Jack Davis from Finance and Budget and Frank Kemp from TGSNA. Um, the the draft of the, both pieces of this. Um, the descriptions that will be eventually updated into the town code and um, some sort of handbook or information that is planning for the November for the new session of the RTM. Um, they're, they're being reviewed at, for, at the next, well, responses are due for the rules meeting in October, so we have a sense on what the different committees, how they feel about it. All the draft work has been completed by um, the people I just mentioned, and we're really grateful for the mammoth effort that some of that took to um, define those things. Um, and then we look, we will, once the descriptions are changed, that will get, update Appendix B of the town code. But we're not looking to do that before November. And depending on how this works out, we may create some sort of handbook or, or definitely update that, you know, in the long run, the, the information that gets sent out to the new RTM members, because um, that hasn't been updated in a while. Um, the only other thing that I would like, um, thank you for um, talking about the election. You know. um, the, I, wanna, I watched the um, meeting, the last meeting of the OPC, and I noticed that Duke mentioned the technology availability for the RTM um, for the second time. Um, and what I'd like to say on that is that, I was hoping to talk to him directly, but I will get in touch with him, um, that 
the town, just so that we're all on the same page, as Kate well knows, the town has an um, outstanding ARPA-funded project to address the technology issues in town hall for all of our committees and, and units. Um, there was an RFP issued in the spring, but we did not have any bidders. So we're still looking for uh, if anyone has any um, ideas on vendors that we had some we were looking, expected to respond, and they did not. I'm sure Kate would love to hear about that. Is yeah, that? we would because, you know, we may need to tweak the RFP. We were basically looking for someone to design the system that we would need to. And implement. Talk and implement the system um, to adapt the auditorium for things like hybrid meetings or presentations is right now. Basically, we've got a screen and we bring in a projector. Um, we want to have something like this set up and with cameras and all. So um, I think it's an important part of getting the town into the 21st century. So sorry, we, it's an important part of getting the town into the 21st century, but we are, because it's federally funded, we are restricted in our ability to just go out and hire. You know, we, we need to follow proper purchasing procurement practices. So the, the other piece of that, there's a second half of that, and that was to provide some technology in some of the meeting rooms um, so that 119 and things like that could be. And so surprise. Are we on the same page on that? Um, so I went yesterday to check out something else having to do with handicap access to the building, but. Um, the Board of Ed in, um, in outfitting the new Oxbridge School had things from the old Oxbridge School that they were um, removing. And IT was in room 119 yesterday installing a um, large screen TV. Yes. Yes. And they provided us with a computer that is dedicated to that TV. Um, so the only thing we really are missing from there for purposes of a hybrid meeting is a camera that would um, be able to show who's in 119 to the people who are on, you know, participating remotely. So along those lines, this is great because you're doing that face work. Um, uh, Mike and um, Jim, Channel 79 has acquired a can. Kando, I think is the thing. And they're happy with it now? We, we tested it okay. and it's good. Um, and Mike is going to, we want to do some more testing. Yep. A Kando is a, is a device that you it's put It's like the owl. It's like what? It, the owl. The owl that we used at Selectman's meetings. A different kind of technology. But, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a tripod, right? It's in the middle of a table. No, it's a, it's a, a device that looks like a, you know. An owl. Of, yeah. No, oh, no, that well, the Kando is different. The Kando, yeah, is Kando looks like you know the the things you have in your home for Google and Amazon and things like that. You know, it's just a device there, but it does a really good job of picking up sound and visuals. And it has a camera that focuses on who's speaking. And what the piece was and the struggle we've had in here is it's worked in here, but we haven't been able to hook it up. This is um, the technology committee, and Mike um, has been in particular doing that, but. Um, the Channel 79 has acquired one, and so we're doing some more testing, and Mike's out of town, but when he gets back, we'll do yeah. more. So that's the piece that we didn't have, which yeah. is to have the cameras. And we're also going to be putting one in 213, a screen, a screen? In 213. But we talked about, and I don't know whether it's necessary if you have fixed screens in either of those, we talked about having a portable unit. Right, that's so that's, we, we really don't feel that that's necessary. Good. Okay, so we are making, pro we're making progress we're on making that. Progress. Um, but, and I do want to, and this is a, um, from a technology committee standpoint, there are operational issues of having, you know, it's easy to have a virtual meeting at this point. We've all got that. And it's easy to have an in-person meeting. The combination is rel raises some really strong issues of how you effectively manage. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm not convinced personally that a 100-person meeting that's part hybrid and part in-person plus public is, is there are definitely problems in trying to manage that kind of information, you know, meeting. And even, and in, I, we, we are going to talk about it, that's going to come up in our next rules meeting, is we're going to lay out some ideas just to get rules thinking about. One is where's the technology, but Kate's, you know, thank you, thank you has um, moved some of that. But the other question is how, you, how the meeting's going to run and how is it effective for the people attending the meetings as well as the public that are viewing the meetings. So there's more to it than just mm -hmm. equipping the rooms. And um, from a standpoint that, as we all know, last April, um, I really don't ever want to be in a position that, you know, that the quorum is based on the technology. Either we're doing all virtual or in person, or we have enough quorum in person that if something happens to the technology, because what happened, the, you know, five days after that, I was on a, um, a music stream, you know, I, I attended a music concert, 
and there were more than there were thousands of people on this. It was mandolin or one of those, and um, they lost the feed for an hour, oh. and they delayed the concert. So this is not contrary to people thinking it's happening all over the place. The concept that you know you can lose feeds and mm -hmm. things like that, and we want to make sure that. We've thought through effectively how to run our meetings because what's most important is that the meeting is successful and that people communicate and that people vote. Um, so, th so that's where we are. And I just want to touch base with Duke to give fill him in on some of the background that you know hadn't really come up in, in that meeting. Okay, okay, good. Yes, and talk about what know. you know how you're doing at the high school. Yes, great. Okay, thank you. So that's that's my report. Uh, correct if I if I may. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. In the planning zoning commission. I think each commission, and I'm not going to talk about boards and, and advisory, we set our own rules for a hybrid and right, person yes. around. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I can tell you from where I sit, Plains Zoning Commission has no interest in doing hybrid meetings. Zero. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what's it's important to you and you want to be here, come. Exactly. If it's, if it's, if it's, if you want to watch it on TV live and not participate, or you want to watch it on TV five days later and send them a letter, you know, that's fine by me, but the last thing I need is someone, right. you know, zooming in from Colorado. And that's know. where I come out on it, too. And so that, that's part of the rules discussion. And, and, and my tendency will be to propose that each committee can decide how they want to function within the RTM committees. Um, but that's yet to be seen. But we also have this issue of making sure we have the technology in place that we can handle things when we need to. We just to make sure it's out there. We have liked the opportunity to have hybrid meetings. We have had people who have wanted to be able to call in on or, or zoom in on, on issues that they found particularly important or we wanted to make quorum or we do try to have as many people as possible. So I just want to put it out there that we have enjoyed that aspect. Yeah, um, I do love the in-person. I think there's there's nothing replaces that, that feeling of being at the table with people and being able to make eye contact and read their mm -hmm. body language and all of that. Um, but I, we have appreciated that someone who's away, you know, could, could or ill, could, could join us. And we have used it. And frequently. I understand that because, but there's... But we're there's, much smaller. I was going to say, the 100 person body changes a lot of the dynamics, which is why we look at it as let, what can we do, and then let people decide how, they, how the rules can decide for certain parts of it, and the committees can decide. And your point about quorum, I think, is very important. You know, typically we don't use it to make quorum. Um, and we did when we when the HHRBC came to you for our appropriation, well, yeah. we did have a failure. The feed, the feed did fail. Yeah, I know, which we, is why I brought all these things up. Yeah. And, and the truth is we solved, we know, that was a clue to begin with, but we, we knew that going in. Yeah. But we've also figured out what went wrong with that, so we could do that, but we're not going there. And But we do want to do a more permanent um, yeah. facility so we have it available to all of us, whoever wants to use the auditorium or any of these other rooms. And thank yeah. you, Kate, that's great. The, yeah. the only last piece I would add to that, if someone is going to run for the RTM and say, I live in Florida all winter long, oh. and I'm never going to be a meeting, yeah. Yeah, they no. should make that known when they're running for the RTM. That's a good point. I mean, that's, you know, if you want to be an absentee first electman that lives in Florida, mm -hmm. you know, and you can zoom in on all your meetings, you know. <laughs> I would kind of like to do that. We got Monica's response yeah. to that already. <laughs> you know? <laughs> if she wants to vote that way, well, that's, you know, I would like to know that in advance if my representative's not. Not going to be available. That's a good point. That's I mean, a good this, point. You've got to remember a lot of this stuff has come up for eons. It has. And, and you know, you guys probably remember, was it Peter Hovell who wanted to do it? Be, he bought a house no, in Palm Springs. No, it wasn't Peter. It was another member of the Board of Finance side. Yeah. That, you know, and, they, and, they, and the decision was no. Yeah. Yeah. But now that we have the technology in place to make it more viable, yeah. but we still need to decide how do we want these these it's, committees yeah. and boards. And each yeah. committee yeah. needs yeah. to decide for themselves because yeah. they're, it's an elected there's position. also some quality of participation. Um, and that depends on the individual. Um, but some individuals may not engage as fully when they're not physically present. Mm -hmm. uh, a, but you experience that because you're re you're required to be there to vote, right? Just in the House chamber when we're voting on things, in when we're voting on the final version. Okay. But committees are still remote, and it's not it's not helpful. It's not at all helpful. So Is, are they doing hybrid at all? Or are they no. Okay. No. So for two full years, we've not had any public hearings in person, and there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion. To your point, when you see someone 
when you're sitting at the table with them or see them in the hallway when they're waiting to testify on something. It's a whole different dimension than on Zoom when they leave right after they've given testimony and wait, we had questions for them. Where'd they go? So it's, it's, not, it's not a good process. Yeah, it, Certainly at the state level when transparency, full transparency and accountability should be first and foremost, and it's not. And then I would also rope in Robert's rules Mm -hmm. Because people start, you know, oh. speaking and well, and that's that, that actually happened during a, an RTM meeting at one point where there was a speaker who was not um, speaking to the agenda item, and people were, you know, as a person running the meeting behind the scenes, people were sending me messages, you know, like shouting, rule, you know, point of order, point of order, and in that that environment, it's kind of hard to stop where when they're all in the auditorium somebody can just stand up and say point of order right. and you know it's a so whole it's a different point. yeah so i mean i i love technology but yeah ditto. be careful going down that road right. uh, totally well, there it, it so. also what we plan to do in there would be beneficial to the town as a whole or to other entities that were coming to like if we wanted to have an employee meeting where we could bring in a speaker you know we can do that virtually rather than um you know, rather than having them come in person, or when a board is doing a presentation, mm -hmm. to be able to do it better than just you know the, the projector and the screen. It's mm -hmm. no, I mean, I, it's we you and I, we're getting really off target. But yeah. I just yeah. took a webinar, and the platform they used was GoToMeeting, and it was a eight-day real estate appraisal class. It was fantastic. You know, and the guy was the, the teacher was out of the country, and everyone was all over. It worked out really well, but you know that's different. Yeah, and we do want to do that in our team meetings too. Like if somebody from Hartford is going to give a presentation on at FOIA, they could do. It. We we might want that to be where some schedule change or something like that. So we're looking forward to getting the the, um, the full blown thing as an option, and then let decide how how to use it. Back. So oh, go ahead, Joe. Okay. Thank you. Back on the Robert's Rules question, I think one of the things we all share is that we have a lot of new people who come in and find Robert's Rules awkward. So if that's, if you end up finding... Um, <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say, and we found. Mm -mm. <laughs> if you end up finding something that's really useful, I think finding a way to share it um, and then maybe so that it can be accessed over time Absolutely. would be helpful. So if you guys I mean, are that's doing funny, Because one of the, and, and, and now I'm really talking out of school, but one of the ideas was um, to have Jim Cameron um, interview some, some people and things like that. That idea got put aside for the thought, well, maybe there's something out there that we can just use and save all the trouble. So that's yet to be determined, but we are okay. on the case, and it's okay. nice to know that it could have a larger audience. Yes. 100 people is a large audience to begin with, though. Yeah, I think it's actually, I think the community there would be a lot of interest in the community. And I, I've got a couple of kids who are interested in Robert's Rules, yeah. and I, I don't quite know why, yeah. but I'm happy to entertain that. Okay. And it is important for people to understand the process mm -hmm. by which mm -hmm. policy d decisions get made. And they often don't, and they don't understand. It's just helpful, it would be tremendously helpful for people to understand how policy gets Can I, do, I just have to say one funny, and you yeah. all know me, so I'm just going to do this. So my daughter says to me one time on a phone call, she said, oh, by the way, all that time of hanging out at RTM meetings, I know Robert's rules, oh. and I'm not the head of a board. <laughs> <laughs> it's hysterical. But it's true. It teaches you your entire life how process should be handled, how decisions, conversations around a board table, discretion, what can be said, what and how you keep protocols in place so that it keeps the conversation productive and civil. Mm -hmm. and jo John City had a book, I think, important. that was Robert's Rules for Dummies. It's right. yellow and black. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's you know, yeah. less than All right, I've now pages. taken that on to say we're going to do a little more focus on this rather than just finding the video to get through it. Yeah, um, it no, sounds like it's, it's, a, it's a, it would be something useful for a lot of parts. It's foundational. Of it's foundational for under people to understand in the government. process. Yes. yes. It would also be helpful for chairs who may come in for like a building committee who don't have government experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we have our new chair guide, but um, mm -hmm. the actual running of a meeting mm -hmm. is um, something that takes a little while to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we could, if we could work on something, I'd be happy to, you know, yeah. help out. 
you know, where we put some kind of a video or PowerPoint together and put it on the website so that people can access it at any time. Mm -hmm. So we were thinking of maybe some sort of handbook, because we have yeah. about four or five different pages that go out to all new RTM members, but this would be to just formalize Yeah, the basics. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there are and, and I would say, Lois, that um, going to your, your description of the committees, I think it would be terrific to include the description of what the actual district chair does. Mm -hmm. And okay. when you are... That's a good um, point. I, I think I, I'm pretty familiar with that handout, and I, <laughs> I, that hasn't been changed in 20 years. Yeah, I had I had some thoughts for that when I was on the RTM for um, making some adjustments. Um, I think letting the committee chairs know, especially uh, when it comes to agendas and minutes, when those should be filed. Um, I, I I personally think we have a few uh, missing agendas and minutes on our various committees so I think laying that out for people and maybe instead of you know focus focus on as a chair this is what you do as a district chair this is what your district chair does um, you know I, I think that'll be really helpful Great. Thank, you. Uh, thank you Lois for terrific um, love to have you anytime <laughs> uh, and Terry, you have anything? Great. A um, couple of things from the state level. Uh, in budget, this was the short term legislative session, so we did a short term budget fixes. And so it's effective for July 1st through June 30th next year. Um, inflation and affordability continue to be big drivers and big concerns across the state from everyone. Um, a couple of things that did pass. Um, there was sort of there were six hundred thousand six hundred million dollars of tax cuts. Well, they're not really tax cuts. They're more tax suspensions. For example, the gas tax was suspended through December first of this year. So that's yes, it's a tax cut for five months. It's not a tax, but it's really it's not permanent. It's not permanent. And same thing with the child tax credit, which is only good for fiscal twenty three. So that's, it's a little hard to hear somebody go, a lot of these tax cuts, well, they're not really, they're not structural. And that's the ongoing concern is that we don't still have effective structural tax cuts that will make a difference in our state, bringing job creators. And that's what certainly our caucus has been focused on, is trying to get some of those proposals pushed um, through the majority party. The other one is the car tax in towns, everyone, I think you, everyone here is aware that the vehicle tax is set by the mill rate in the indiv individual town where the person lives. So in some towns, yeah, a Honda Acura is paying a very different mill rate than they are in some towns. If the mill rate's 14 mills, you're paying a different rate somewhere. In the urban districts tend to have much higher mill rates. Same car is being taxed at a mill rate of 69. So that was changed in 75 towns out of 169. The mill rate will now go to 32 mills. You will not pay anything more than 32 mills. So while that was a tax cut for some people, they have to take that lost revenue and take it from somewhere else in the budget to give, those, give that back to those towns to keep them whole. So again, it's not, they were not truly structural tax cuts, and I think people need to be aware of that. But it's a tax, so the mill rate's a cap. It's not, they're not raising dairy in 16 to 32. No. Correct. It's a cap on the mill rate. And if you're, cap, if your right. mill rate, say, is 40 right. for real estate, okay. your mill rate for vehicles is capped at 32. Got it. Understood. Good distinction. And does right. that money go to the state or does it go to the local? It goes, it continues to go to the local municipality, but okay. for the municipality that has a 55 mill rate, the state will make up that a difference. difference. So that is coming, now. it's still coming from tax revenue, income tax revenue, or the revenues of the state. So the income tax revenue is 50% of our revenues. So it is still coming from somewhere. It's not a tax cut. Um, the big issues, the next session starts January 4th, and the big continuing issues are certainly the zoning issues. Um, robust discussions are continuing from the affordable housing advocates and the zoning advocates. Um, I know um, 
Red Woodbridge just had a lawsuit um, brought on them that their zoning continues to be discriminatory. So it'll be interesting to follow that and important to follow that for all towns to understand where, what is the problem we're trying to solve and does this effectively solve the problem? I think it's always, that should be in that book. <laughs> Certainly as a legislator, I've learned that is to always ask, what is the problem that needs to be solved and is this an effective solution? How is this an effective solution? And to learn the details. And sometimes it, it's a top, you know, the top line tagline will look really good, but effectively it doesn't address the issue. So. Which is which is exactly what Woodbridge's problem is. Woodbridge is, is 98 or 97 percent zoned single family. It doesn't even have it's, you know, it's math wise. It's three percent commercial. You're not going to make them go 30 percent commercial. Right. That's so yes, the headline is exactly what you said, but if you look underneath the headline, the substance of it, yeah. it, it mean, it's it's meaningless. You yeah. like really. We used to have re need to right. be reasoned. I don't anyway. even know if they have sewers up there. Uh, that they don't. Yes. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, the other one is a, certainly on the education front, addressing the learning loss of so many kids in our state, particularly the urban districts. Learning loss is significant, and now we're seeing the numbers, the polling, and the information that is coming out on this, and that's going to be something that's going to have to be addressed. And the last last but not least, is the police removing the qualified immunity in July of 2020 uh, on the police is continuing to harm everyone in the state. All the poli police recruiting is down. It's hard to get police officers to stay past their commitment year, which I think is 20, 20 years. It then. varies. So that remains a, an issue on the state level and affects public safety. I mean, we saw it in Norwalk where a police officer was attacked pretty savagely during the Oyster Festival. And when there's, when there are a group of people, some of whom are legislators, attacking police departments publicly, and police officers. Verbally. This is, say that again? Verbally. Yeah, verbally. <laughs> Thank you, good, very good point Just because of, of that oyster. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> right. You, it creates, it creates an environment that may invite that. So I, I think that's something that will continue to need to be looked at. So on that front, is it, do you also look at, I'm sure you do, but do you also look at state lines? I mean, I, if I'm in, in New Canada Cop and I cross the border and go into Pound Ridge and there is immunity in Pound Ridge and the salary's the same, I would transfer to Pound Ridge. That's a good you know, question. Same with, same I, I, with like, you know, Connecticut and Rhode Island or Connecticut and Long Island. Right. Not, I don't think there's a lot of states that have removed qualified immunity. Right. I will find out, though. I, I will find out. You know I, I, I mean, it's a little bit like teachers. I can get a teachers can move to wherever they want to. If you're right. a great math teacher, you can go to. That's right. Yeah. There's, there's a whole host of issues. And it's, you know, it's Agreed. not just that issue, it's also the public perception of police officers mm -hmm. um, making it less desirable to take that kind of a job. Right. Um, but then there's just also changes in people, the, the generational mindset, mm -hmm. um, the nature of police work, and things like, you know, you have to work weekends, or you have to work holidays. And that's not appealing to everybody. You know, it's, you know, for some it's, you know, the drive to do that kind of work does not outweigh the downside of it. So there's a whole host of things happening. And then for some communities, the, um, the wages, the benefits that they offer, make them less attractive and make other communities more attractive. I 100% agree. I mean, you hear about people leaving New York City all the time and going out to Suffolk County. Well, <laughs> total, <laughs> total other. <laughs> I mean, the the salaries for public safety personnel on Long Island are just ridiculous, high, high, ridiculously high, compared to what the city pays. Um, but I'm talking about things like we have a defined benefit pension plan for our police officers. Um, other communities are moving away from that, mm -hmm. and so we've been the beneficiaries of that in Darien, and that we've been able to recruit certified police officers to come here because of that part of the benefit package. 
Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Just Terry, I ongoing would add, discussions. Yeah, I would add to um, on the land use. I'm on the la I'm on a land use subcommittee for the Connecticut Council of Municipalities, and so they have um, narrowed down their focus. That they this committee will then present to the full CCM, the full um, board, and transit-oriented development. I think it was Bill 5429. Does that sound right? Okay. So that is um, going to be put forth, and the question is, will the um, will this will CCM vote to include an opt-out provision in that as something that they will then present to the legislature in Hartford? So, so that is already being um, uh, worked on very, very uh, right. They're yeah, and Jeremy. Ginsburg said that he, he's on this with me, and he said he's never seen focus this early in in the season on this. So the the transit oriented development will definitely be a big thing this year. And Jeremy said on both sides of the of the issue. I'm sorry. On both sides of the issue, or just on one side of the issue. What do you mean, both sides of the issue? Some people are really for it, mm -hmm. oh, and some people are really advocates against it. and right. Yeah. Our our position is that. Um, if this goes forward, we would like an opt-out provision for Darien. We feel very strongly on that. Well, especially given through. all the development that mm -hmm. we have right. right now, and what I'm hearing from a number of people is they're happy about it, or they're okay with it. Okay with it. Want to see how we absorb right? Yeah, the that. extra yeah. people, extra traffic, extra everything, yeah. and. We need time to allow that to digest, so to yeah, speak. Right. And you know, one of the things that happens with state legislation, and not just on this kind of thing, but um, you can't have a cookie cutter approach. It, right. You know, what works in some communities is going to be um, very detrimental to other communities, mm -hmm. and you can't look at things in isolation. Okay. That's thank it. you. Okay. Thank you. Steve? Great. Thank you. You've um, got five minutes. <laughs> I think that's going to go really yeah, fast. Yeah, we need a I know. I'm going to go, okay, over. <laughs> that's good. Uh, no, I understand. Um, thank you. Um, since our last meeting, we now have two new commissioners on the um, planning zone commission. Amy Barsanti took over for Kara Gately's seat um, somewhere around the middle of June. And then Mike Netter um, took over Jim Rand's seat um, at our last meeting, which was September 5th. Um, it actually, the, the, the nomination or the finding of these other people was actually the process that I like. Amy was the former chairman of the RTM Planning Zoning Housing Committee, and Mike Netter was the former chairman of the um, Zoning Board of Appeals. You know, that's how I came up the ranks, too. Um, and I kind of call it going from JB to varsity. Well, it's the process again. Yeah. You it's understand good. the process yeah, and how it. the pieces all interplay together. And it goes to Robert's rule and knowing the right. systems and all that mm -hmm. stuff works. Um, at our last meeting, the thing that was really super important is we finalized and approved the Darien Affordable Housing Plan. Um, that was um, issued, the report was issued on June 16th. Um, it was on the town website. We had a public hearing on July 26th. Um, well, we, we sent out invitations to all of our Hartford de delegation. Terry Wood made some comments on it. Um, Monica McNally made some comments on it. Um, um, Tracy Moore, Tara Moore, um, Tracy Moore made some yeah. made some comments on it. Who is running for the position? Um, and Jamie Stevenson made some comments, and some other people in town. We did not, sorry,ly say, do not hear from Mr. Duff or. Uh, Ms. Miller or um, or Mr. Blumenthal, and and they were sent personal invitations. They're the one that made us do it. I would have kind of thought that they're our district that they would have commented, but they didn't. So that's okay. Um, at our last meeting, we did instruct staff to draft an opt-out um, resolution for the ADU. That was one of the parts of the last zoning designation thing. Um, we did debate that in July, and we had a public hearing on it on September 6th. Um, and a lot of stuff that we do, which is the affordable housing plan and the um, affordable housing um, opt-out provision, we do have public hearings. 
other towns do not have public hearings. They just make their own decisions. So if it takes us a little bit longer to do some of these items, is because we do want to have a public hearing on it, and we don't want to do it, you know, just six people making a decision, um, plus our ex officio people. So Steve, as I understand, the plan was actually completed by the due date, the public hearing is what caused delayed, us to, yeah. right, yeah. delayed us, okay, but yeah. the plan was completed. The plan was completed and drafted and posted um, on um, June 16th. Right. Which is before, the, I think the July 1st deadline is when it was. Right. Um, and it was out there for public comment and out there for review and on that, on that front, we wanted to have a public <laughs> hearing. I don't think Westport did and I don't think Greenwich had a public hearing on theirs. I don't know what, um, don't know what New Canaan did. Uh, but that isn't a very important thing. Because um, every once in a while, not to get too deep into the weeds, every once in a while we get like, you know, from a reporter said, hey, you know, you guys didn't do your affordable housing plan. We're like, yes, we did. You know, but it has to get filed with the state mm -hmm. and because of the way we handled it, it got longer. And I, I think it came out good. Um, we, we, didn't, we didn't put in a lot of things in there that some towns may say, like they want to, a town may say Woodbridge, we want to, you know, rezone Main Street to commercial. We didn't do that. Some towns may do stuff like that. That's not our plan. We're not going to do that because that it comes up with a host of factors. Um, and if anybody wants to know our stance on the opt out provision for the um, affordable housing um, item, we'd rather do it ourselves with local control. The as ADU. We can, yeah, the ADUs, yes, uh, thank you. Um, versus having a state mandated item. We did the same thing with parking. Um, for the opt-out provision on parking, and we did the same thing for another one, I forget what it is offhand, but eventually that has to get approved by the RTM. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, what's next? Then I just go through a couple different items and I'll go kind of really sort of fast. We still have a lot of building and construction and plans going on in town. Um, a lot of the stuff is, is Half completed, a lot of stuff is three quarters completed, a lot of stuff is still in, in the starting phase. Um, the big ones that I can highlight were the ones we had multiple meetings on, such as BMW is, is finished with their phase one construction. We had multiple, multiple meetings on that. The phase one construction was um, a car wash, which people were afraid of. You can't see the car wash from the street, you can't hear it, you can't do anything, and there's really no operational changes. The next thing you're going to do is, is um, demo the service, the, um, the service building in the back, and rebuild that. Um, Oxbridge School was another great one. Um, there you are, sorry. Um, I was invited to the ribbon cutting, too. That thing came out fantastic. Um, relative to where a PNZ comes in, we did not get one complaint over the three years that came in. Um, when that did come in front of planning and zoning, there was definitely some contentious meetings. Mm -hmm. um, it got through planning and zoning um, with minor, minor changes, and it came out fantastic. Um, you know, so you should very be congratulated on that. It was great. And with regards to the phase two, which is going to take another year, and Kip Kuntz, who's the building co-chairman, he is very open and transparent about it. It's done, but it's not done. It's a soft opening. The temporary library, temporary gym, and temporary cafeteria is fantastic. Yeah, he's the chairman. You can't, uh, co-chairman. Co -chairman. Yeah. Yeah. Duke, yeah. Duke, Duke is the other. I thought, okay, sorry, it's, my apologies. Yeah, it's Kip's running it, and Duke yeah. didn't say Kip runs it. If you went to another school, you could even tell those things are temporary. Yeah. There's no way. Um, so that, that is something that you should be really proud of. Um, the, the Darien Playhouse, that's done, done, done. Um, La Taqueria opened, which is the latest um, addition to our downtown. Um, I think the Laurent Lighting is going to either open last week or this week or next week. Um, that's in place. I think, um, I think I'm doing a ribbon cutting this week. That's it. If you go back to my speech at the town of the town, you know, or the state of the town, it's going to be ribbon cuttings and groundbreaking. What was the last one you mentioned? La Taqueria. It's a right, little bar. Right, before that. Um, Laurent Lighting. Yeah, Laurent Lighting. Oh, got it. It's Sorry. a lighting store yeah, yeah. Um, that's on the corner that right. faces at Darren's Porch Shop. Um, it's, they did a beautiful job on their store. Um, Kennedy's Barbershop opened um, a while ago. Kennedy's Barbershop changed their name to Rudy's Barbershop, but I think it's the same exact people. <laughs> um, we have a big sign regulation in town, and to switch a sign from Kennedy's to Rudy's takes, is a process. Um, <laughs> But that went through with that. That was ribbon cutting last week. See that? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
I saw, I saw Monica saw me, and she goes, all right, I gotta go. I'm like, where are you going? I got another meeting with Ribbon County. I was like, have at it. I'm going to clean the garage. Uh, so it was fun. Um, another one, 1897 Boston Post Road, is done, done, done. That building's got five apartments in it. It is a 20% affordable housing um, component. Our regulations are only 14% or 12% of the time. That is 20% affordable housing. Um, there's gonna be two retailers in there. It's Dairy and Kitchen and Bath. Did you cut their ribbon yet? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. You'll see there, so you'll be there soon. And then the other one's gonna be, it's called um, Moots, M-O-O-T-S. It's a, like a little convenience store there, oh. which gets vibrancy for that part of town. There's a crosswalk nice. that crosses you over. Yes. There's new, apart there's new nice. apartments there. It's, it's a beautiful building. It looks beautiful. It really is. Yeah. And they do, you know what, can I just say, nice on the landscaping too. Yeah. Yeah, they do a very thing. nice job. Um, the one that you're not going to have a ribbon cutting in 2022 <laughs> is Bird Code. Okay. Um, that is at the old HSBC that's closer to the other end of town. Okay. We had multiple, multiple meetings on that. Um, that is slated to start work in October um, and be open in January 2023. What is it going to be? It is a, um, a quick service restaurant that specializes in chicken. It is not a Chick-fil-A. Um, it is not a Popeye's chicken. It's going to be really nice. It's a gentleman and his wife that have an outlet that's, I think, in West Hartford. Um, mm -hmm. They're coming down here to open up a and new wh store. What's it called? It's called Bird Code. B I R D C O D. Yeah. Bird yeah. Code. And when are you expected to? When will it be open? Ja she, she, Monica will cut the ribbon in January 2023. Do you get a good meal out of it? Or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it so should be nice. Um, Bird Code. So there's one in West Hartford now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we in, in, in a lot of these applications, and we I put them on my um, quick list is some of these things are contentious, and some of these things have sound requirements. Some of these things have traffic requirements. We we it, it takes a long time to get something approved by Darien Planning Zoning. We had the chief of police for Darien go up to West Hartford and look at their store okay. to make sure the traffic was going to be okay. I think he was going to check out the food. But I think he was <laughs> He did go to West Hartford to check it out. I think Jimmy did check it out yeah. next time I'm up there. So, yeah. so um, it, it's it, we don't it, it doesn't get passed in you know overnight. Um, what's next? Um, the other thing that's kind of important you're going to see something going on. The Subway store and Bell Cleaners closed um, a while a little while ago. Mm -hmm. Subway is closed on Heights Road. You're going to see that building demolished soon. Um, oh. And it's going to get flattened. It's also was on the market for sale, the piece of land. Um, there's the building next to it, which is the hair salon mm -hmm. up and down, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that's staying at this point in time, but someday we're going to see something there and we monitor that. If you know that backs up directly to, um, federal. to federal. Federal. Yeah. federal's in discussion, they know about it. I made sure they know about it, and we'll see what happens and goes from there. So, Steve, does, is Subway doing the demo? No, the owner Subway, um, they, their lease got terminated. I think their lease was a 10-year lease. I think it ended. They did not renew. Okay. Um, so they moved out. Um, now the landlord that owns it, which is a out-of-town landlord, I'm going to say it's, I think it's an old, um, of, of an old Darien-based family. I think both of them live in Florida now. Um, and I think some moved, moved around. They wanted to sell it, um, but they're going to demo it first. So they found demoing it would help with the sale process. There's also it, it as it's you know it's all it, well, it's all public now as a dry cleaner. Oh, right. Yeah, it there are issues there. Different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they might be taking out some dirt and sending it to another part of the country. Right. Um, Steve, as long as you're talking about my area of the town, um, any anything on Blue Wave Tech? No, you know I drove by that one too today. They're on. A, 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 there, there is some movement in town hall or in the RTM for a blight commission for commercial. I think they're mm -hmm. on that list. Um, oh. I'm not privy to that list. I'm not on the commission, uh, but that's. Well, there is. There probably is no list for commercial, but I believe the blight review go. board is looking to consider asking for commercial. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I've gotten some complaints from about other things, not yeah. Blue Wave Taco, so I can direct them over to. Yeah. Well, they they have no authority over commercial right. properties right there now, so that's they 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 may seek that kind of authority. That that will be on their agenda. Either they either meet tonight. tonight. Yeah. yeah. So they, that is on their agenda to discuss. Okay, good. I'm I not can sure. direct that. Yeah, I'm not question. sure. It might be an executive though, Lois. I'm not okay. sure. Thank you. But it's it's it. We, from a planning zoning commission, we look at everything. I, it, I can tell you, I voted against that 
three times because that knew it was never going to work. Yeah, and it never I worked. did that when they did the first round. Yeah. And we got left at. Yeah, and, they, and they, you know, I've been in the rest of the business a long time. You know, I'm only 32 years old, but I've been in the business for 30 years. Um, it, 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 it was never going to work. Yeah. Right. And it didn't. Um, the other thing that's kind of important to us, and we're going to get a little bit into my speech in traffic, and I'll try to go as fast as I can, is um, the road construction started at Neroton Avenue and West Avenue. They're going to widen that road. They already started cutting, diamond cutting the things. Um, a lot of state money was in there, and thank you to um, Terry's efforts and whatnot. Um, they're widening the road, I think, with extra turning lanes there. Mm -hmm. That was part of the Planning Zone Commission for federal, going way back when. Um, there are also all the lights that go from that intersection all the way down to Ledge Road, uh, is it Ledge Road? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ledge Road are going to be all timed, um, and federal paid for that whole thing. Um, I'll get to your section of time a little bit. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 check, I check her section all the time. Um, the other thing that's important, and I, I don't ever look at Darian as, as, a, um, as a silo, because we do have to watch out outside our borders. The thing that's important to Darian residents, I think, and it happens when we're talking about bird code and other things, Target is coming to Norwalk. Target is going to take over Walmart. Um, really? Really? Yeah. yeah. Target's going to take over Walmart. That's been announced by, by the REIT. Walmart's going out. Target's coming in. Um, I personally think that Target is may create more traffic. It's close to the border of Darien. There's no more room for more traffic. There's there. no more. Well, it's going to get worse. Um, right. Wegmans I is coming to Walmart. I Well, are we, Wegmans, Wegmans has where? passed all the zoning regs. Yeah. Wegmans is, that's a done deal. Interesting. Wegmans is going behind um, Costco. They're replacing MBI. Yeah, yes. replacing MBI. It's, it's kind of like. Between Costco and, um, oh gosh. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the, the back exit of Costco is exactly yeah. an exit of yeah. Wegmans. Yeah. The Wegmans, it's pretty, and, it's pretty and I worked on the Wegmans deal in West Harrison on Corporate Park Drive. It's my favorite place. It's at the yeah. end of a dead end road, and it's got about a parking for like a thousand cars. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. humongous. Yeah. Um, when does construction start? Probably after the first of the year. Because um, they had to, MBI had to move someplace else first, and that deal's done, and now Wickman's is going in, and they get all their planning zoning approvals. Because they're not that close to our border, you know, we didn't really chime in. When we did, and it didn't, they, it didn't pass, and they kind of withdrew the, the application. When we did 7-Eleven, which did not pass by zoning and zoning, mainly because of traffic, um, we did notify um, Norwalk, um, you know, we don't get notified on that. And that will affect us because going into traffic, when I say that we get complaints, we don't get complaints, the biggest soft complaint that we've gotten most recently after, I want to say the pandemic has ended and it really has not ended, is traffic on the post road that goes from our railroad tracks um, to the Norwalk border. It's really not on the other side which is from Dunkin' Donuts towards Stanford, it's the other way. And all this stuff is the other way. Um, so we just have to watch stuff like that. That's our, that's our biggest thing. Relative to, um, to building and, and whatnot, you gotta remember, and, and if I, I was also on TV 79 with the Compton Town Hall people, and we talked about that, and Jim Cameron interviewed me. We said, why is Darien Zone the way it is, and how did it grow? In, in Norwalk and in Stanford, um, I, over the summer, I got to play golf with uh, the big developer in, um, in Norwalk. They're building in Norwalk multifamily and affordable housing every day. They're breaking ground on new projects all the time. Stanford, I just got, when it hit my desk yesterday, it's another 470 units in Stanford on the border of um, the Ripawam River. Mm -hmm. So they're still building there. The difference between Stanford and Norwalk and Darien is they have excess school capacity in, in those towns. Um, in, St in Stanford in particular, the developer that built the West End, the first thing he had to do was build an elementary school. Um, in Norwalk, they also built in Norwalk, um, I think it's a hundred million dollar school is the number that I heard. There's a new high school that was built in Norwalk and they're going to renovate the next one. They have excess, excess capacity. I don't know your numbers today. We don't, okay? We don't have as much as somebody else has. So relative to what we talked about earlier with growth and traffic and whatnot, I would like to see us you know, absorb the 300 units that right. we have in the pipeline before we start doing more. You can't really control that, but in, in some way, shape, and form, we are trying to control it. Um, 
Darien Commons is the next one I'm gonna talk about. That one's near completed. Um, the first building with 58 units is gonna open up um, somewhere between October 15th and the rent, the leases will start on November 1st. Um, relative to school Commons kids. Federal. Darien, federal. federal, yes. Everyone calls it federal and you call it federal, but I've, I've recently switched to Darien Commons. Um, I speak to those guys um, once a week. They, um, in terms of school children, we ask them to keep us abreast and keep you abreast, and I think they speak to Adley. There are going to be um, one new child to the Darien um, School District as a result of that project. There's gonna be three kids in there, two of them already live, live in town, and they're switching from like my house to live in that building. So it's a net zero. Mm -hmm. um, they're already enrolled in town. Um, they also do have a um, affordable component. The first building has eight affordable units in it out of the 58. They had the lottery for that, um, for the affordable housing on September 8th, which was last Thursday. Um, what they usually do for the lottery, there's only eight units, they'll, they'll select, for argument's sake, 20 names out of whoever applies. Um, the first 20 there, and then for argument's sake, if the apartment's not ready till November and you don't want to move there, and you're number two on the list, they go to number nine and 10, so it's a rolling thing. Um, they also have eight going into the second building. The second building, you're not gonna cut that ribbon until next year. Um, they, so that's going to that's gonna be nice. Um, in terms of new tenants, um, they've got 11 tenants that they've announced already. Um, and they go from like a coffee shop and a, and a salon, a, a couple of restaurants. The latest one they put in there is um, Choice Pets, is one of the newer ones that they signed up for. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Seymour's is going to be a great seafood place. And um, we'll make sure we got Van Leeuwen's ice cream for um, <laughs> for Linda. Um, they have four more that are that are going to be coming in, so they have a total of eleven. They're not going to have seriously. They're, they're not going to have their ribbon cutting until the retail tenants are in place. But the residential is going to open up now, right. um, and then the retail will open up later. If you go through there, and I had the opportunity to walk it again um, last Thursday, I think, or last Tuesday, it's they did a great job. So they're Steve, really the retail and any of these restaurants, et cetera, they really won't be open until winter? Yes. Or, oh, in, in probably the 23? Yes. In the, retail, in the retail business, um, in development, there's usually a blackout that starts somewhere around October 1st, October 15th through February. Because if you can't get open by Christmas or you can't get open by Thanksgiving, there's no sense in opening. You stay where oh, yeah. okay, you are. Yeah, you don't, you don't open. So okay. they just they don't open. I Good hate to, see to leave. You. I gotta go. So they don't. Thanks, they don't. Terry. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Terry. Good to see Bye. you. Bye. So they don't open. So they, they you know the retailers after the Christmas season, holiday okay. season, all that stuff, then they'll start to open up so in, in January. Okay. So that'll be next year. Um, what else? One of the big things relative to traffic and kids and safety in school. And I've been on these, these guys' case since the very beginning. I call it the up and over staircase that goes from a Guan field, it goes up and over the project, and it goes into, um, it goes into like the front door of Walgreens. They're gonna open that hopefully this week, maybe next week, because I know a lot of kids when they're going to school, and I drive, to, I drive through downtown um, Northern Heights every morning at like seven o'clock. The kids walk that way. And I want them to be able to walk that day when they leave Middlesex School to walk up and over because all those sidewalks are done. The town did a lot of spent a lot of money in the last few years, and, and federal did the same thing, redoing all the sidewalks, mostly all the sidewalks from um, Hollow Tree Ridge Road all the way to Nerone Avenue. And the last piece of the puzzle we talked about a little bit ago is the Nerone Heights. I mean, I'm sorry, West Avenue and Nerone Avenue. Um, that'll be done. So. I mean, I see kids riding their bikes, and the, loop, the newest thing is these electric bikes. These kids are flying around on those little electric bikes. Um, so those stairs are going to be up and open soon. Those stairs will be perfect for the electric bike. Exactly. <laughs> you can go flying down and put your skateboard on that okay. railing. Okay. Uh, so that, that's going to be open. Um, that, is, that is federal. What's the next one on my list? Um, where am I? Um, the, Cor the Corbin District. Building one is done. If the building one is effectively called the, the Tibbetts building. That's been um, topped out. There are four, four, there are four apartments inside there. The ground floor of that is the dry cleaners um, and a couple other tenants, God bless you. Um, um, 
that that building is supposed to be open again November first. I think all I think two of the four apartments are rented. Those are I think going to be kind of snowbirding snowbirding people that have another house in town, go to Florida, and when it opens, it opens. If it opens in November, they're probably not going to move in until Christmas. Um, the the other thing that's important about that the first floor commercial retail space along Corbin the Corbin Drive is a hundred percent leased. They, they've not leased all the storage yet on Post Road that goes from Corbin towards the interstate, but all of Corbin Drive is um, leased on both sides. And so when that opens, those three buildings open, um, all the retail tenants are done. And the apartments, you know, it doesn't take long to rent apartments um, in that neck of the woods. Excuse me. Um, the other thing, just going back to federal for, for a second, is the last thing that federal did, we talked about it, relative to, um, to Choice Pets, they came back to us and said, hey, can we switch the zoning to allow about 10% of the ground floor to be um, office or dental or, or whatnot? Um, I, again, I work in the commercial real estate business and I do a lot of um, new construction, a part of my projects, all around the, 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 you know, the multi-state area, which is really Westchester County, Connecticut. Most new shopping centers have a Delta Dental or Aspen Dental in an, in an urgent care type place. That lands up being inside shopping centers now. Our code did not allow, you're not allowed to have a dentist on the ground floor. You're really not allowed to have a doctor on the ground floor in, in a retail district. You can go over to 777 West Avenue and there is a doctor in that building. I think they might have some ground floor, but it's really not, that's not in the, in the situation. So as, as moving our zoning code along with the times we said inside we want it to be retail inside this complex you're allowed to have 10 percent of the ground of the ground floor to be um, commercial and as part of that 10 percent you have equinox in there you have citibank in there you have um, edward jones and you have um, walgreens you know so you might see a delta dental on the ground floor i don't really think you're going to see an urgent care but if they have an urgent care tenant come in um, in some way, shape, or forms, that would be allowed. What about um, animal, like veterinarian? No, like you didn't approve yeah, that. Okay. No, we didn't approve that. Um, that 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 did come up um, that they wanted to put like a veterinarian right. around the floor, and right. it didn't. Yeah. That didn't get any traction. Um, but they do have a like I said earlier, choice pets, so you can buy your your dog collar or your cat collar. You know, no cats. I didn't think so. <laughs> I mean, she lived really close, and she has a big dog. Um, so you can you can do that there. So that was something that I think is is important that we did. Um, Corbin District, we talked about that. The buildings are pretty much um, topped out. There's three buildings on Corbin Drive. Um, the the first one we call the Tibbetts Building. The middle one I call the Compass Building. Compass Realty is going to be in the last one. We call the Bank of America Building. That's pretty much the height that they're going to be at. Um, and so you can see that today, um, which is which is nice, and we they, we knew that in advance. Um, what else do we have? Another one that's going to come down the road that was approved by ARB, the Darren Sports Shop, is going to do a renovation of their facade, which is the front facade, which is really the back facade. They're going to um, change that a little bit. There's a window above. They want to close that window and make and make it um, a little bit more open. We talked a little bit about the high school lights at the Darien High School. That one we're going to debate it again or to find out a resolution um, next week. Um, Tokeny Club came in for a renovation for theirs. Um, they're redoing their pool and they had it this way, they switched it that way. Um, that's a project again, it's going to take them two years to do it. That's a long time. Um, the building that you and I looked at over on Tokeny Road, that was a site that's next on the corner of Old Kings Highway and Tokenique Road. It was an old, um, not an old, it was, it was a church in some way, shape, or form. It was way back when, for people before my time, I never knew it was a dinner theater. Yeah. Um, it, it was on the market for sale. A lot of developers looked at it to tear it down and put apartments there. Um, it's not zoned for apartments. So any developer that did come to Darien and say, we want to put apartments there, they were discouraged not to pursue that. Um, avenue because it probably wouldn't work. Um, eventually, it did get sold to another, um, I would say, religious institution, um, and so it stayed the same. They already took title to it, 
Um, and I think they're not going to change it much at all. Um, what else do we have? The last couple items. There are a couple. Um, we didn't talk much about about um, Palmer's. There's no real update on Palmer's. They have their approval, and we'll see what happens with them. Um, you know, they can start pull the building permit tomorrow, uh, but there's no real change to what they've done. Um, the other thing that's too um, that's kind of important to me is. Um, over the, over the summer in August, I had another conversation with Frosty the Snowman. Um, he came to us last year um, when, when he wanted to come to town to do a little march in town. Monica and I walked downtown. It's got to do with the walkability of our downtown Darien. So Frosty does want to come back to Darien to do a walk downtown. So we have to do a little bit of, of um, walkability and traffic mitigation. Over the summer, I met with um, Mr. Dolcetti, who has a project that is um, in the area where Frosty wants to work when he marches around town. And the other end of town um, is the Darren Sport Shop. I spoke to Mr. Conzi, who works with um, the Darren Sport Shop. And because they're doing the renovation, we might have some additional sidewalks that are put in that neck of the woods to make downtown more walkable. The idea is that he's gonna start at, you know, across the street from the Darren Sport Shop, go up, Darien, go up um, the post road, cross over, and then go back to Darren Sport Shop. So, in our town, we've done a lot of walkability studies. I met with Joe Pankowski, um, relative to the, the people on the aging, on the town, the, uh, what's, what's this commission called? Commission on Aging. Commission on Aging, they're, they're, concerned, they're concerned with it. I met with um, Mr. Vaccaro, Mr. Genovese, all the big developers in town, and everyone's kind of on board. The thing that's important, I also met with Jeremy and um, Ed Gentile. There's a lot of, we've talked about this for a year, public private partnership on who pays for some of this stuff because it's expensive to build sidewalks. Um, so well, I'm gonna speak to the Board of Selectmen and you again on it and further the conversations see where it goes. Um, that's pretty much it for me. I used a little bit more than five minutes. So I, apologize. <laughs> I know everybody's got things, other appointments. So um, any, any comments for Steve? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Always appreciate the, the um, update. Um, if there are no additional comments, may I have a motion to adjourn? Uh, motion Steve to adjourn. moves. Jill seconds. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Terrific.